All right. Um, I guess we already have a discussion going on here on the stage, so we might as well switch on the microphones. <laughs> and everybody is still having coffee, you could join us. <laughs> so I would like to start off the panel um, with a question that, um, that somehow um, is often asked by, by public media um, asking about uh, fabrication is um, how far is this from reality and when will we be, will we be seeing these things in actual, um, in actual built environment and how will the cities look like when, when all of these um, new methods and materials that uh, we're developing are put to use. Um, Is this on? Yeah. Um, well, I, I always tell people that the buildings we are starting to design now, or infrastructure or whatever, they're not going to be built within five to ten years from now, probably. So I wouldn't be surprised if we very shortly start designing projects with printed products in there. Um, the other question, uh, in which way it's going to influence the world around us, I think is a completely different question and that very much depends on um, both the designers, whether they're coming up with new designs that can only be made with additive manufacturing, for example, or any of the other <coughs> techniques uh, displayed today, um, uh, or whether we run into problems where additive manufacturing or digital fabrication is the only solution. So um, it could be short term, it could be a bit longer term, I guess. I think it's, it's probably about... Someone? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think it's probably about um, what type of processes and what um, part of the industry. I mean, obviously, right now, there's a lot of um, robotic work that's been done in terms of prefabrication in factories, which is then brought to site. Um, but I think the, the critical question, as you're saying, is like, how does it actually change what we do? And, and I suspect it'll only be a very small group of people who are actually initially changing what we do. And whenever there's new technology, that technology is typically r just reapplied to replace um, an old technology and to produce old things. And the example I, I always use in lectures is that um, is the first iron bridge. Um, there was an iron bridge that was built in 1780-something in England, and it's a radical new material in a way, like using metal to build a bridge for the first time. Um, but it's detailed like a timber bridge. It looks like a timber bridge. For, you know, all... It basically could be a timber bridge, except it happens to be made from metal. And this is what generally happens. And so I think we can see that with 3D concrete printing now that's happening in, in mainly in China. There's a lot of 3D, well, a lot, there's a, okay, there are several people who are doing it who are producing you know, multiple buildings which are 3D printed out of concrete. And these look like every other building, like you couldn't possibly tell it's 3D printed. Um, so I think it often takes a long time for the industry, like. Um, the construction industry, but also for designers. I think you know, a lot of the conservative actually comes within our profession. Like we want to just keep on replicating what we know. And so I think the onus is on us to figure out what can you do with these new technologies which is radically different to what you could do. Um, and obviously steel bridges now are radically different to, um, to timber bridges, but it's taken, you know, it takes a while to get there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point, and something similar can be seen, for example, in industries now talking about uh, the perspective of the fiber composites. Um, it, it's been used in, for example, um, car industry, but they use it often in a way how they were used for their metal processes before. Like, that's, there's this term called black metal, where they just say, okay, we use the same processes, it's just a little bit lighter. They don't really uh, incorporate the material characteristic and think the whole process from the beginning, which is understandable because there's this giant pipeline uh, behind it. And um, for architecture, it's even worse because there's no industry. Yeah? That's actually the point. Like, we need to produce these things ourselves because no, no one else could do it. That opens two opportunities. Either you get, as an architect, you get better back a bigger piece of the cake, let's say it was, okay, I'm designing this, but I'm also making part of the fa specialized fabrication for the composite parts, or there needs to be 
uh, industry that develops once there's a, a demand and uh, opportunity for the project uh, there. But for now, for example, with our wood project, it's much more easy to bring that into, uh, into the industry because milling wood is not an unknown thing. It's just if you do it in a slightly smarter way, people are open for that. With the composites, it's really like some steps further, I would say. Yeah. I think the useful thing to understand is that what <coughs> we're, the technologies we're using and the, um, and the materials are not in any way new. Um, I mean, industrial robots have been around since 1953. Um, Fiberglass was developed, I believe, during the Second World War. The first fully fiberglass, fully composite house was built in 1957. We were actually using things which are somehow like actually quite old. Um, it's just that they've never really been pushed to their um, to their limit or really fully explored. And maybe this is something worth discussing. Like, why is this the case? Why is it now that there's a group, you know? I guess a group of our contemporaries who are interested in these in these materials. Um, I suspect it's got something to do with the, its relationship to computational design. Um, we're all now involved in in designing geometries which are extremely hard to make in the current building paradigm. So we're obviously looking for other possibilities that we're taking from automotive or aerospace industries, boating industries. Um, and what's your take on this? Why has it taken so long? And why is there suddenly a kind of intensive interest? Um, in it now. Yeah, anyone? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, it's the same for additive manufacturing. It's been around since the 80s. Um, and I've been thinking about that, and I do think that computational power and, and software tools that allow us to come up with designs that we can prove digitally, at least, work and, and, and could be built, um, we have that possibility now, uh, but we often uh, were forced to simplify our digital designs in order to uh, prepare them for fabrication, and I do think that uh, computational design has uh, stimulated everyone to, uh, to look a little bit further to actually be able to build what we, uh, what we designed. Maybe I add a little bit. Um, I think there's also a trust between industries, like um, fabricators do not usually trust architects um, because they the drawings, hello, uh, the drawings don't work, they don't understand the geometry, so they add this extra cost uh, with, just to redraw things what is um, presented them as a sketch. So these things add up um, by time and by cost, and I think th um, if we get better communication between uh, uh, fabricators, builders, designers, I think that also drives down the cost um, just by trusting each other. But there's also, there's a relationship between uh, technological innovation and then uh, kind of culture and cultural values. Mm -hmm. And it takes so many stakeholders to make great buildings happen or just to make buildings happen. And I think that a part of the kind of the agency of technology is in its ability to change the culture within which um, innovation, architectural innovation is possible. And so it's the culture of the discipline of architecture and the allied disciplines, right? So there's the first layer, which is disciplinary, like why are architects doing this or not doing this? Uh, then the second one would be the industries that are connected to those technologies that allow for architecture to be delivered in those terms. And then there's the kind of the broader culture, the stakeholders, like the, um, the, the great clients, the public that want certain buildings. And so I think that many of us are, are involved in teaching, and I think that in a way this issue of uh, experimental practice. It's not only about this kind of direct translation from prototype to building, but also a way of uh, shaping the culture within which uh, the kind of architecture that we care about happens. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you on the on the culture side of it. Um, it's we're we're getting to a point where, or we have gotten there um, a, a while ago, where digital design has matured to a level where there's not that much you can do in the virtual realm uh, anymore. There, all the possibilities pretty much have been 
explored, and at one point we have to start moving beyond digital and connecting to the physical world, um, which I think at the moment is the, is the biggest challenge, how to connect um, digital design to actual physical processes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree, and I think that um, a lot of that's... What we're seeing over the last couple of years within um, experimental architecture a lot of push towards um, real-time robotics, and I think this is going to be the key. I think where it... Because right now we're either encoding material behavior within the algorithm, or we're um, imposing the algorithm upon material. Um, I think as soon as we... Well, as we're, we continue or, you know, we're really just starting off this development of um, real-time robotics, we're able to actually bring a closeness between um, material behavior and algorithmic behavior, which I think will perhaps address some of that. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in, uh, in Salome's uh, project, you really think a 3D printer can do anything, especially if it's in a case of powder. I mean, there's nothing that can fall off, but it still has limitations and uh, and the actual um, means of production um, changed the way you, you design objects. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can add to uh, what Raoul and Igor said before, it's not only the architects that maybe are doubted sometimes for their knowledge. It's also uh, the engineering firms that um, don't always have the best link to real building, so we know we know how to calculate and we know how material behaves, but it's, we don't often get our hands dirty. And I think now it, it, what's becoming really interesting is that all of a sudden our digital output, the product we normally deliver, um, is being fed directly into the machine. So uh, that's a huge uh, responsibility. So all of a sudden we need to be much more knowledgeable on not only production techniques, but also, um, the, yeah the actual production of products and, 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 and how different variables influence that and the quality of the products. For me, that's, that's super interesting, but it also requires uh, my colleagues to uh, gain a lot of knowledge and experience. But I personally only think that's a good thing, but it narrows the gap between design and production and um, I guess also allows to uh, look at the integration of different variables yeah, in a more holistic way, mm. making or sort of hopefully leading to a more optimized results. I think we have a question in the audience. Can we yes. get a mic? Hi, Hi guys. I thank you so much for your presentation. So I will make a bit of trouble, uh, but, you know, friendly one. So I, think, uh, so I think a couple of people already reflected on the kind of connections between the earlier paradigm of 1990s, which is the use of you know, 3D modeling uh, to come up with new uh, non kind of right non planar geometries, and then how isn't this wonderful that 3D printing now allows us to build it? And I guess I want you to think a bit a bit deeper about it, right? Because exactly the fact that it looks so natural is problematic, right? So 21 years ago, Greg Lean introduces Elias to Columbia Architecture School. He starts paradigm one, right? Because the LS didn't have doors and uh, walls, people start making complex geometry. So that's already your fathers have been doing it. Now your generation comes in and says, oh, great, where's 3D printers? You can actually now print complex geometry. But you know, it's a bit too easy. Why not use 3D printing to make perfect 19th century buildings? Why not use 3D printing to make perfect cubes? Like, for example, there is this building outside, right, which was put like in three hours in front of our eyes. It's not 3D printed, but in many ways it's much more innovative because we took a sail and we pressed it into a concrete and you get this incredibly interesting central surface. So my point is, you know, obviously you are on, on a cutting edge, and that's wonderful, but I think that this kind of slippage, right, from a paradigm one to paradigm two, and the fact that this kind of complex aesthetics becomes the default aesthetics of 3D printed architecture, it's like a bit too easy, right? Uh, so what if we kind of try to do something very different? And maybe there are already examples I'm not thinking about. Maybe let's say you're printing 3D house, which is just a cube, but what you're actually printing is holes for sensors inside, right? Um, so things like that. So any, any reflections? Uh, I'm happy to answer that. Um, okay, so there's, there's quite a few bits to the question. Um, on the f 
the first one, why, why wouldn't we build perfect cubes or why wouldn't we build neoclassical buildings? Um, I think as, as architects, I mean, particularly perhaps as young architects, I think we have a responsibility to try and figure out what is the, the architecture of our time. And I think we need to respond to a contemporary intellectual discourse and in intellectual context. I mean, for example, my work is concerned with um, prim primarily with complexity theory, which is a very different way of thinking about um, formation and the way things come into being in the world. And I'm interested in designing through those mechanisms. So I'm not about to design something of a previous paradigm if this is the way I understand the world. So that's one intellectual um, r argument as to why you might design in a certain way. I think another one is, um, why wouldn't you buy a, build a perfect cube? Well, I mean, a cube is, um, apart from being you know, a, a certain type of geometry which has a kind of cultural understanding, um, we build cubes typically because we have sheet material. I mean, material comes in sheet form. Um, if material is not coming in sheet form, then it probably doesn't make sense to build a cube. A cube is structurally not very strong. Um, it's not very efficient in terms of material. Like, there's ways of 3D printing things which have much more, dare I say, organic forms which are, um, are far more efficient. So even if you're just going to make a, purely, a pure argument about efficiency, there's no way you'd, you'd 3D print cubes. So, um, and to tackle the third, more a third point of your uh, question, um, I think it's really, it's, I appreciate you saying um, the geometries that we're dealing with, in a way, at least have their, um, their basis in the work of Greg Lynn from 93. Yeah, I think all this work is not possible if it wasn't for the work Greg Lynn was doing in the early 90s at Columbia. Um, and I think some of the work that's happening in, in the contemporary sphere, it's people who are taking those geometries and trying to figure out how to build them. And when they do it, some of that work is not altering at all. Like, it's still the pure geometry that's driven by modeling techniques and certain algorithmic approaches. Um, I think some of the work that's happening here is not quite like that necessarily. Um, like, I think that if you look at something like Moritz and, and Akim's work, they're very directly saying what is the behavior of material and what is the, um, the fabrication technique. And I think, that's my, interp my understanding of your work, is that's actually what's driving um, the forms. It's not being driven by you know, a software side thing. And I would probably make the argument about my work that's a bit of a, um, a feedback between them. So part of it is driven by um, an interest in the, these expressive qualities of algorithmic design, and then part of it is driven by what is the behavior of materials and robotics. So it's sort of a, it's sort of a feedback, but I don't know. You, you guys probably all feel fairly strongly about that question. I mean. Yeah, I guess it's, um, that's also an understanding um, of, of, of form that's very, uh, uh, yeah, not driven from the contemporary um, uh, design theory and, 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 and processes. So when we say that now our, our design is much more based in the expression of the material behavior and the, um, the fabrication strategies, um, of course you can, you, 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 you can, you can, you can build a cube, but um, that's really only based on, um, I don't know, a purely aesthetical uh, judgment of the thing, and it's not really um, uh, developed uh, fr from the core of the construction strategy. I agree with the sheet material uh, approach, but even nowadays with a sheet material, you would rather do a segmented shell structure, for example, uh, if, if, if you want to use the material in an appropriate way. Huh? Um, uh, but it's true that a lot of this um, uh, biolo biological analogies are used uh, ah, in a far too superficial way. So a lot of people are alluding to that loosely, but uh, don't really transfer uh, 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 the inherent um, capacity of these structures. Uh, so there's not a, a, a process of understanding, abstraction, and transfer, and also an understanding that this tra technological transfer then later might look really different from what you actually saw in the beginning in, in your biological role model. Yeah? Often it's more like a mere aesthetic analogy. So that's why, I don't know, like there's a lot of talks of architects where biology is somehow used because it's nowadays fashion. Yeah? So, sorry. So you consider yourself a purist in this way? Like, it's something almost religious in the way you describe this, right? <laughs> so it's like, it's well, almost like um, that there is something inherently of value or, or right about 
what's in nature, and therefore the most <laughs> pure trans um, you know, transfer of that into architecture is important. Yeah, so it's about the functional principle. Yeah? And uh, the new aesthetics uh, come along with, uh, with the way how the, how the tools and, uh, and the materials and how you apply them uh, uh, get uh, implemented. But um, uh, yeah, the, it's not about an aesthetic uh, transfer, but it's about a functional transfer from biology into construction. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add one other thing, uh, just a comment about the kind of foundations of architecture as a, as a discipline. There's a whole kind of history of the discipline where uh, that's, you know, of course, about architects uh, drawing, not building, right? Or, I mean, in today's paradigm, we could say that maybe it's a drawing, maybe it's, maybe it's a script. But in any case, one of the disciplinary projects for architecture is to always forge relationships between technique, techniques of production in the architect studio, so things that architects do, and techniques of construction, fabrication, making that make those propositions or speculations possible in the real world. And so I think that that's one of our disciplinary responsibilities is to maintain that relationship between those two sets of processes. And so it's a part of the reason why the kinds of tools that we're using um, in the virtual realm, let's say, or in our fabrication studios while we're prototyping are also then reflected in what kinds of instructions we make for the buildings that need to be made um, out there in the world. Just, just a very short footnote. So you guys done very well, you pass. But just a little footnote. I mean, I think obviously we're all interested how to define a logic and aesthetic you know, architecture or art for our time, which is different from previous generations. But it's a very difficult question, right? So people mention the word efficiency, which I think is still taken for granted. This is a concept from 1860. Engineers were defined as people who were efficiency experts in 1860. So that's a very modern idea. That's a very old idea. Complexity theory, as you know, it's 1960. So it's also a very old idea, right? So how to be contemporary, really contemporary, right? It, it's very, very difficult, you know, and I think the only way to do it is to question every single concept you'll be using. <laughs> so keep going, but just a footnote. <laughs> I mean, it's very hard to do, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the question of aesthetics is, um, is a very interesting one because a, a lot of times it's argued for through um, structure or some mathematics or Mm, I don't know, engineers using algorithms to, um, to optimize structures might say it's more honest or, or this is the way the materials perform. But, but there's always an algorithm that is written by a human being that is um, actually curating the way the system can behave. It's, it's never endless possibilities. There's always some, some kind of curation in the process. And I think that's, that's where, like, you still, you, you can never argue for, like, there is no uh, ultimate truth, so there's always some kind of aesthetical kind of, um, yeah, author's intent embedded. Yeah, if I can briefly comment to that, I think there are just many ways of aesthetics, many levels, many ways to look at what is, the right solution or what is beautiful and what is not. And to also briefly respond to the, the gentleman's comment, uh, I, for me as an engineer, not an architect, it's just important that um, people are honest about it. You can, it's fine for me if you make a bridge that looks like a butterfly wing, but if, if it just the looks instead of the, the, the structural um, um, an idea behind it that actually resulted in the in the butterfly wing, then I, yeah, I I like it to that to be communicated. So if it's just if it's a re Renaissance facade on a Chinese printed house that's just glued on there, that's fine if that's what the goal was at that moment. But uh, it's not a Renaissance house, and um, so I think there are many different levels. But I'd like to um, uh, to be open about it at least. Yeah, I think um, 
uh, it would be a misconception to say that algorithms replace the designer in a way. Yeah? The, 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 just the level on which you design just shifted a bit. It's like more like a meta design. You, you design the algorithm, you design uh, the, the boundary conditions which need to get resolved. You can tweak some parameters. You get offered a variety of options that would all be somehow feasible. And then, of course, you still decide to go for the one where there's the other one. Yeah? So it's, uh, it's more yeah. like a meta design. Yeah. There's, kind of, there's kind of two issues here. One is the issue of um, abstraction, like how close you are to the thing that you're designing. Are you directly designing it, or are you setting up the conditions from which something emerges? But then the other one is about um, a reliance on pseudo-objectivity or whether you embrace subjectivity. Um, I firmly believe that architecture is part of the humanities, not part of the sciences. I mean, that's the position I take. Um, and given that, I believe that all the decisions that we take um, in, in our projects, which are highly abstract in terms of their, um, their generative process, are entirely subjective. Um, I would never claim, I would never um, um, defer authorship in any way to something which um, I believe to be objective. Um, I would never defer authorship to something which is um, numerical, um, which is the only way a computer can possibly evaluate something. Um, I would claim that everything we do is, sub is subjective, even if it operates through a highly computational process. If we just um, thinking about typical conversation with architects, so the, if there is aesthetics, there is my aesthetic, your aesthetics, and we need to come up with a conclusion, like what to do. It's like actually a very hard part of our <laughs> discipline to agree on anything. It's like there's no objective layer. Or like sometimes people come up with this uh, pseudo scientific or pseudo other reasons to prove their project is better than a third one. Um, and it's kind of a, there's a certain honesty. You just tell that's I like it. That's why it's the it should be like that. Or they, you think there is a something else? <laughs> Does it? Well, I don't think that subjectivity is randomness. I mean, one's judgment can be quite sophisticated and layered and conditioned <laughs> by many things. And so, I don't think that subjectivity means I like it or I don't like it. But that there are some of um, judgments and decisions that one makes along the way, right, towards um, uh, as a means to uh, some goal. I think it's, in, yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. I think it's, um, this liking it or not is, um, is based on incredibly nuanced, often, hopefully, very well argued set of, of reasons for something, but those, th those reasons can't be um, quantified, they're all qualitative. And I think part of this is because all the things that we really value in architecture are actually qualitative. None of them are quantitative things. Um, yeah. Criteria for subjectivity. Yeah. Right. No, it yeah. totally exists. And I think part of this, you, you're, you alluded to this idea of like, how do we discuss these things if there's no objectivity? I think part of it comes down to, are we trying to create an architecture which is um, something that can be disseminated and almost develop um, within the mainstream, or are you interested in making an architecture which is esoteric and individual and strange and, and personal and unique? Um, I think when I first started doing the work, well, not even when I first started, probably if I've spent 15 years working on this multi-agent algorithmic um, behavioral formation project, um, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would say that I was trying to establish a way of design that could be disseminated, that people could pick up and start working with this as a tool. And now I begin to realize that none of those things are things I care about. The things I actually care about are all the kind of unique, strange, esoteric qualities of the, of the projects we're doing. To me, they're things that are really important. They're thing, actually things that I think resonate with people. I think the way you design something is, you know, outside of yourself and the academy, it's entirely irrelevant. I think uh, what we kind of do is uh, we develop our own vocabulary. And one of the part of the vocabulary is the, um, how we achieve this vocabulary is through code. Um, but it's like, I feel like the challenge is um, not to solve everything with the same tool, but how do we uh, merge things together? Like, I mean, 
this building here. This is a metal work, this is a stone work, this is concrete work. They, they're all different tools to make these things. So how do we make this come together again? Like we, we, we develop something unique and then we start using things from the old and new and some others. And I think this communication is gonna be quite challenging for uh, next decade. Yeah, if you're talking about the building, I think the sort of layered approach that we're having now, where each functionality has its own layer, I think that's also outdated. We're already uh, yeah. looking into that. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you look your uh, node, I mean, you didn't invent the cables again. Like, the, the, I mean, th that's what I think. It's just that it's not like layered, but I think it's uh, there's a place for a different method for fabrication for a different task, structurally, functionally. We can't just solve with the same tool everything. Like a 3D printed house is the kind of, I can't say st stupid idea, but I think it's just a little bit immature to think like we do one method everything. We haven't done anything with the one method. It's a part of the reason why we could probably all agree that there is this kind of uh, circulation of um, pavilion architecture that we've all been a part of that's possible and that's actually highly productive as far as research goes, but that of course is not an indication of um, everything that goes into a building of another scale, right? So you can uh, still deal with uh, not necessarily forms that are monolithic, but a process that's monolithic, right? Where one or two things can maybe do the work that is a part of the kind of proof of concept or an exploration or an experiment or whatever, however your practice is framed, but that very quickly in terms of more conventional um, long-term buildings, you would encounter um, composite conditions, details, um, climate, and that all of so and none of those things can be resolved with a single set of tools. Yeah, that's that, that's actually actually true. But I still think that uh, I mean, if you said the uh, research uh, pavilions are a really interesting tool to foreground one research agenda and uh, push that further, while other aspects can be a little bit uh, taken back. But um, I also think there's um, um, there's the urge or really the need uh, to. Um, before this robotic frenzy, let's call it, like everyone who does a robot, it's fancy, uh, is over, to turn that into one thing that has really like a, a valid, that can be, can be really implemented. And that, that's really important to make that, uh, to that point, to make that leap. And um, I think that, um, I mean, things that we're currently addressing is um, functional integration. How can, for example, a lightweight structure that doesn't have any terminal mass be uh, thermally activated, for example? How can, while you wind the fibers, be small pipes integrated? How can senders be integrated? Integrated. So, uh, how can a building skin be integrated? Those are all topics that need to be addressed, of course, step by step, because it's like re you're re rethinking the whole thing from the bottom up. Um, but I think those are really important steps. Rather than the jumping from one pavilion to the next fancy thing, there needs to be a little bit like a continuation of development, and only then you get the chance to actually implement it uh, uh, later on. And also the design argument, um, one thing is also that it's, of course, it's very um, uh, technology and performance driven, but ultimately we also expand the design repertoire. Yeah? We, we, we explore novel tectonics, material articulations, characteristic, also light atmospheres, how the glass fibers, you know, guiding the light, all these things are also uh, really valuable in these explorations. I think a really important aspect of that is, um, and I totally agree with you, is that um, these technologies or techniques are hopefully there to expand the space of architectural design possibility. And I think that's what we're, pro I mean, I see them as all inherently experimental because they're opening up new space in which you can um, explore. Um, I, I just want to go back to the first part of what you're saying, where it was a, which, are we moving too quickly to actually ever be able to realize buildings at a larger scale? Like, it's not, you know, I can make a pavilion and I can craft it myself, um, but I can't make a building this size myself. Um, now, I could start up a construction company to try and do it, but I, I'm probably not going to do that. Um, but I don't think I could find a construction company to build the things that I'm designing or build the things that I'm prototyping. Um, so. If we're developing really, I guess, if we're, trying, if we're exploring and developing um, robotic forms of fabrication, um, 
are we actually just causing another problem for ourselves in terms of that technology transfer, even if it's quite possible, like it's quite possible, right? We can say, look, I've got some robots that can do something. Um, I can demonstrate it can work. Um, now, why don't you just go and buy some robots and start making my buildings for me? I mean, it's quite possible to say that, and it, but it's probably not going to happen. I mean, I can think of one example where it has worked well, which is the Gramazio Cola model of the, um, of the brick, where they've developed the brick laying technique, then they basically gave it to a company, the IP, and that company now is able to build their buildings. Um, what's the strategy? I mean, what do you guys think? How serious are we about getting these things out of the lab and out of pavilions and into this scale of building? And if we're to do that, um, what has to happen? But isn't it as simple as just finding the right clients? I mean, no, I, I don't think it's the client. I think it's, the, it's actually the construction industry. We have to find the right people who are willing no, but, yeah, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I think if there is a client who wants one of your designs actually built on a skill like this and willing to pay for it, I'm sure there will be a contractor actually willing to build it. Mm, well, I guess in my experience, I mean, I'm not building buildings this size, but I'm building small buildings. And in my experience, um, I can develop techniques in the lab which I know I can build very cheaply and efficiently. Um, but I can't find anybody in industry who's willing to actually um, take that IP or that R&D and actually um, really construct it. So consequently, what I end up doing is building simplified, designing simplified versions of what I want, which then still cost way more to produce than the, um, the, the techniques we would have used in the lab. Um, so my experience has not been that. My experience has not been the clients are willing to build these things, but actually finding fabricators who are willing to do it is extremely difficult. But then you're asking them to adopt um, the, the technique, but also maybe the design part. Don't you think that if you, if you have a client and, um, uh, and a design, and you're just looking for someone who, to actually build it, would they still choose the most expensive technique? Don't you think there would be anyone willing to look into what you uh, developed in the lab? It's about risk, I think, ultimately. As um, soon as contractors are doing something they don't, don't know how to do, um, there's inherent risk in it for them. Yeah. And it's actually, this is the real problem, ultimately. Yeah. I mean, risk I is probably agree. the ultimate problem just in general. It's like the risk of the contractor, but more so, actually, the risk of the designer. Like, you know, we're probably all more conservative than we think we are. And it's like architects <laughs> are not willing to take risks, fabricators are not willing to take risks, clients are not willing to take risks. And that perhaps that's the reason why some of the things that we imagine aren't as possible as we would like to believe them to be. Yeah. Well, um, and maybe it also depends on the technique, but with additive manufacturing for us for quite a long time, the contractor part, so the building builder part, who was responsible for the end product, uh, was a bit of a gap. But actually, there are a couple of contractors in the Netherlands, especially standing up, really trying to um, present themselves as the most innovative contractors, totally looking into additive manufacturing. I'm not sure if they've ever, I'm pretty sure they've never actually done it, but they're telling the whole world that they will be the ones to do so. So I'm going to keep them to their words and uh, <laughs> build something as soon as possible. Um, I'm afraid we have to wrap up soon. Are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> okay, so it's not me. It's a question from a question from a from messenger from a from a uh, you know, uh, Apple messenger, who's I was like I was uh, I was communicating with my friend from Michael Sorkin office about the panel, and she wants to ask like two questions. Uh, uh, seriously, no, we're good ones. So <laughs> yeah. So first, okay. So, so this question from a friend who works at Michael Sorkin office, and now it's early morning in New York. So the question is, is this still a one-off? Three, you know, three points. Is this still one-off? And then the second question was, assets are doing 3D fab interesting. Q question is, can they scale it up? So I know you guys already started addressing it, uh, but I think one-off question hasn't been addressed as much. So. Uh, 
I, th I think architecture is always a one-off. I mean, often a one-off, let's say. You need to find individual solutions for the specific tasks that you have. That's actually also the problem why you can't transfer uh, um, uh, yeah, techniques from industry for theory production so easily if you want to have a, a very specific solution to your architectural uh, uh, problem. Yeah? So uh, ideally, it's a one-off. And um, the scaling up is a really big issue, specifically working, like uh, referring back to, for example, the biological structure. Scaling is always like a really big boundary. Half of the stuff that's interesting, you can't actually use it because it's not scalable. Right? That's a very important aspect you need to be uh, aware of. And um, we are currently uh, having various parallel research projects running, which are about scaling uh, the technologies I've shown uh, up into. Uh, large, large scale, uh, either in situ uh, monocoque fabrication or close to site large component fabrication. Those are bigger than you could actually transport. Uh, they are only manageable to put together on site. Just to add, I think you asked like, how do we get out of the lab and get to the real world? Well, I think that what you're doing is one of the things like you continuously do one thing and develop it as a product, like as a solution product or service product. And I think that's a one way of uh, getting closer to industry and adaptation. In one point, you probably could potentially wrap it up to, as a, um, with a company or something who, who can provide the service. But I have a question uh, which is kind of aesthetical. How do you actually pick the final pavilion shape and textures and um, who makes this decision and how this decision process is uh, usually in your office or um, is it going to be one meeting or is it you saying like, well, that's it, we go for it or like time is up, we need to be, pick, up the, um, pick up the shape and start doing it or how, can you a little bit open up the background on that, that front? Usually it's kind of, I, I feel it's a so dense, uh, dense moment when somebody needs to start doing it and then there's these discussions and like who's saying is like what or which way and uh, yeah. yeah yeah I think um, the two pavilions I've shown were a little bit um, uh, they had d different different procedures how that would make was make made uh, the first one had exactly the situation that you said we developed a computational tool we tweaked it we worked on it and somebody said okay uh, uh, that's good enough, uh, uh, write out the code, uh, get the robot running, otherwise we don't make it in time anywhere. Huh? Uh, so that's why it's really, like you mentioned that before, what is sometimes called honest by people, yeah? It's, it's really uh, rough, like fresh from the oven onto the machine. Um, with the second pavilion, uh, we had a really interesting and really nice catalog of fiber layouts that would, uh, most of them would have worked uh, less or uh, better. And um, uh, there we had a longer discussion about how can we actually highlight the qualities of that uh, structure. So how can you actually have uh, interesting uh, gradients and densities uh, and uh, how can this uh, fiber um, yeah, characteristic be nicely articulated. Uh, so there's a little bit of both. I would say it's really coming from the algorithm, but then there's still a discussion about. I think the, the you have that multiple people. Sure, yeah. We, we, we have a, a group of core research associates who are developing the project, and then there's a larger team. And then, of course, we have regular meetings, we discuss it, we develop the code together. Yeah. I, I think the easiest way to answer that question is every single step is um, a design decision that leads to it. Like, I don't think it's something which there's a process that's set up which is somehow autonomous, and then out of a plethora of potential outcomes, one is chosen. I think it's just a constant process of design decision and refinement. So um, every time you write a line of code, that's, that line of code has got design decisions based it, in it. I think every time that you, um, that you run an iteration, you change a parameter, you change an input, um, all those decisions um, are guiding it. So I, I mean, I don't think we really select something. I think we just, it's almost like, I think it's more like craft. You just constantly fine tuning something and, and it's, like, it's almost like a block of something you're whittling away at. You're slowly crafting the thing to get it to be the point that you want it to be. Um, I think sometimes this assumption about algorithmic design being a field of possibility that you search through is not quite 
the way it really operates. Yeah, I mean, the same what you're mentioning for the digital is also true for the, for the physical fabrication. Like, while you're designing your tool, you're designing your design outcome as well. So basically... And feedback between those things. Yeah, exactly. So it's not a technical task, okay, now I built a tool and later I see what I can design with it. But while you make decisions on how this tool is arranged, you make design decisions okay. along the way. Yeah. One so thing enables the other, right? We need to understand our tools better. <laughs> we need to um, make decisions while creating our tools. And we need people that are willing to take risks, I think, uh, to get these things out of the lab. Um, thank you very much for uh, this panel. Um, you can uh, take a risk and become an e-resident of Estonia. And with this, you can uh, then connect. <laughs> um, and yeah, for it's, it's, it's a little, um, just a little bit of yeah, explaining. Yeah. It's a little, um, these guys are our sponsors. They're Estonian designers who designed the world's smallest ID card reader, which you probably know about the Estonian people in the whole, uh, the Plus ID. It's pretty, uh, pretty cool, pretty beautiful little tiny thing. Um, but yeah, we're, we're about to wrap up the symposium. Um, are you guys ready? to continue on to the Architecture Museum and then continue, continue, continue the discussion, but in a different venue. <laughs> uh, right. But anyway, I'll just take a minute to um, say the last few words, um, you know, before we all um, go continue with the other events of the Biennale. First of all, I would like to say that when we started thinking about this, well, yeah, the, the two intense days, I think it's the shortest major event of the Biennale, right? Out of the all major things, the symposium is only two days, but it's super intense. It was super intense these two days. I think we had a lot of diversity. We had a lot of discussion, which was exactly the point of this specific symposium, um, to have different views, different topics, different approaches, different. Illustrate the diversity of architectural landscape that we actually have. Uh, so I think that was probably a success. Do you agree? All right. Good. Yeah, the, the second most important thing, apart from accomplishing the mission, so to say, uh, I think are the thank yous, and there are a lot of those. Um, first of all, obviously, to the audience who actually came here. And then today I learned a pretty amazing thing, that we were watched the, the direct stream yesterday of the, of the first day of the symposium was watched by multiple thousand people, which for an architecture event, I think is pretty damn good. Uh, so, um, yeah, awesome job, uh, all the listeners and participants. Then obviously the speakers, but the speakers are also tied to our team. So the biggest thank yous are to the team and to the speakers who actually made it across the ocean from Australia, from Japan, from the United States, from all over the place. Um, huge thank you to you guys and to all the speakers who are still around. A round of applause. And obviously, this wouldn't be able, the symposium wouldn't have come up the way it did, or it wouldn't have happened without the team behind it. And I don't mean the curatorial team, which is myself. I mean the team of TAB, the Italian Architecture Biennale. Because the reality is that most of the speakers whom you've seen during the last two days were invited by our other team members, not actually myself. The, even the space that we find ourselves in right now is actually the Tab Lab space, which is a whole different exhibition who was kind enough to loan it to us for two days and actually made, I think, made the event even more awesome than it would have been otherwise, just considering how the spaces worked. So a huge thank you for Tab Lab for being around and setting up the space for us. Um, and also, the Tab Club, which is right next door, right? Because I found that a lot of people like to just kind of let, you know, they would come here and sit in the conference format. They would go to the Tab Club and just kind of chill and, you know, listen in, but at the same time work. So I think this, um, yeah, the venue is just superb this year. We should definitely continue it next time uh, with the same, you know, the same venue, the same place. Um, but Another one, another little thank you, is obviously to our sponsors. <laughs> because, um, you know, somebody needs to pay for the show, right? So, a, a lot of thanks to the sponsors. Um, just a round of applause for those, too. Um, all right, so the next, the next thing I wanted to say was that um, 
which will publish all the speeches, all the talks, and probably all the discussions as well on the Estonian Center of Architecture Vimeo uh, channel, just so you guys know. Uh, plus, those of you who registered at the door when you came in, we collected, um, you know, if you wanted to, you left the emails. So we're going to send, once that stuff is ready, once, you know, the whole post-production thing is done, then we're going to send links and information and follow-ups to those people who provided their um, information to us. Um, and the last thing that I want to say is that we have a pretty dense day today. Uh, for example, in just 15 minutes at 5.30 in Tab Club starts the discussion uh, of the vision competition that was opened yesterday in Viru. Uh, with, you know, the discussion is going to take place right there, right? Uh, with all the winners and you know, the jury, I assume. Um, so you can go ahead and check that out. Then at 7.30, um, opens the main exhibition in the architecture, um, architecture museum, um, right team? I guess so. Um, so yeah, please um, be most welcome to come and join us for that because it, it is the main exhibition and all of these guys are participating so I think we should do totally go there. Um, and then after that we have a gala at nine o'clock and then the party back here uh, in the tab club at 2300. So, Everybody with the passes, please come and join, hang out, talk, continue discussions, and just have a great time. And just from me, thank you so much to everyone again uh, for listening, for participating, for even for asking questions, um, those few of you. Uh, and uh, yeah, see you later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan.